use your sponsored video. Vaseline, huh? Yeah, I like Vaseline. Flies in the Vaseline we are. Sometimes it blows my mind. Who is that? Stone Temple no, Pilots. STP, man. The late Scott Wyland. Rest in peace, Scott Wyland. I love that guy. <laughs> He's amazing. He's as amazing as... Uh, He's amazing. As David Bowie, though. Yeah, sad day. Did you even know he was sick? I didn't even know he was I sick. I did not know he was sick. Did anybody know he was sick? I don't know. I didn't know that Professor Snape was sick either. Yeah, I didn't either. Hans Gruber. <laughs> Nobody's talking about Hans Gruber. Everybody's talking about Professor Snape. Yeah, or Marvin the Martian. Oh, not Martian. Marvin, <laughs> Marvin the robot from... Um, Oh yeah, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Did you see Ron Poteet put a, a a meme up? It was a picture of Marvin. It's no. uh, everyone's so busy talking about the passing of uh, Professor Snape, Snape yeah. and it said, uh, and no one's even noticed me. How typical. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay, we are on live in the studio. Less of me and more of you. Flies in the Vaseline we are. That song is gonna be stuck in my head. Mm -hmm. Keep getting stuck there all the time. Hello. <laughs> Keep accidentally locking the wheels of my ball chair. <laughs> This just in. There are turkeys <laughs> being distributed in Cincinnati <laughs> all over the ten pack. Where'd my notes go? I don't know, I got mine. My handy dandy stormtrooper pin and my stormtrooper mug. I had to put this on the camera for Michael Hansen's oh, um, yeah. sake, yeah, because I, I was on live with them mm -hmm. uh, this week, and he has the Darth Vader version. Does he? Yes. Where'd you get it? Um, it was a gift. Huh? But I can't remember from whom. <sighs> it's nice. Yes, I like it. It makes These me aren't the drawers you're looking. It for. makes me want to drink something. Sinister, like blue milk or something from it. Blue milk, dude. You see that one meme? It's like it's, it had this thing that said, "No, no epic story begins with drinking milk," and then it's just Luke drinking <laughs> pouring milk into, the, into this into this cup. That's brilliant. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, you know what I need today in church history. Do you have um? You have your blurb and all that good stuff. Uh, I'll come up with something. Sometimes it blows my mind. Keep getting stuck here all the time. Oh, is it you? Is it me? Is it something you can't see? Na 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 na. Don't remember the rest of these words. Somewhere in the Vaseline. You know, um, <laughs> that was a song in your twenties, right? Yes. <laughs> What was it? The song in your twelve? Ten? <laughs> twelve? Maybe. <laughs> See, I was ten and eighteen. Were you allowed to listen to that kind 92. of music whenever you that? Old? No, I wasn't, but I listened to it. <laughs> <laughs> I had hidden copies of Doggy Style from uh, <laughs> Snoop Dogg all over my room. <laughs> Literally, I listened to gangster rap at that point in time. What? I was a gangster. Wow. Yeah. 
Dude, I was at that time. See, that was ninety, like ninety two, ninety three. Yeah, mid early nineties or whatever. Mm-hmm. I was so far into the alternative grunge music. Uh, well, not necessarily grunge, because it didn't really even get that label until no, a little bit later. At right. the time, it was just alternative. Right. And at that time, alternative really meant alternative, alternative because what it meant it was pop. right. I'm not listening to Top 40. Right. I'm listening to an alternative, something right. that no one likes. To exactly. Me. <laughs> but then Nirvana came along and messed all that up. Yeah, uh, Nirvana and Pearl Jam. They were really kind of the Pearl Jam's the ones 10 that, album. Is, mm-hmm, that broke out. Top 10 albums of all time, <laughs> Pearl Jam 10. But I, I still remember introducing um, Smells Like Teen Spirit by Nirvana yeah. to people and them going, this is the weirdest thing I've ever heard. Do you like this? You know? Are you serious? Yeah, because everyone was into into Guns N' Roses right. and uh, whatever, Twisted you know, Sister. Whitney Houston yeah. or whatever on pop channels, yeah. that uh, it didn't make any sense that I was listening to Susie and the Banshees <laughs> and, <laughs> and Depeche Mode and <laughs> Concrete Blonde. <laughs> Social distortion. See, and then for me as a young adult, we were listening to a totally different type of alternative, which was like Bright Eyes. I don't know if you ever listened Mm -hmm. to that. Uh, uh, Stephon Stevens. Oh, okay. That that kind of stuff, which is totally different from anybody else's stuff. Right. Sound like somebody was coming upstairs. (laughs) Sriracha. Are we ready to load this thing up? Uh, Yeah, sure. To go with it? Mm Mm-hmm. All right. What well, is this episode 81? No one's in the chat room. Of course not. Of course not. We're on our own. Okay, here we go. Actually, I'm going to do the promo. Just because. Hey, all you Theosciples! I'm Michael. And I'm Brendan from Finding Christ in Cinema. You are listening to the Theonauts Podcast with your hosts, David and Jeremiah. Right here at GCTNetwork.com. Your Great Commission Transmission. This is episode 81. The one where God be with you, mighty men of valor. The Theonauts Podcast. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Explore the vast reaches of God's word. Hey, you Theonaut heads out there. I actually had a better Theo word. I was, what was it? I was going to say Theo Men of Valor, oh, but, but I kind of stole destroyed my it. Name. No, I'm sorry. So I'm David Gaddy. I'm a man of valor. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we are the Theo Nods. I'm Jeremiah Ward, by the way. Hey, what's up? So, Dave. How's things going, man? Yeah, yeah. How, made any resolutions, keeping them, breaking them? Breaking them all. Breaking them. I, You know, I didn't make any this year. Did you not? I resolved not to resolve. Yeah. Yeah. I am resolved. I no, no. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. I kind of do um, inadvertently. Like, I don't ever really sit down and say, okay, this is what I'm resolving to do X, Y, and Z. Uh-huh. But I find myself still recharged and restarting things and sure. just naturally. Well, for me, this year, this new year, like this new year is uh, – a total do-over from 2015. <laughs> 2015 was probably the worst year I've ever had in my entire life. So, 2016 That is, means God is working mightily in your life. That's right. 2016 is going to be epic. Yes. I have, I have every confidence 2016 is where it's at. Yes. <laughs> and and so, there, there might be some good out of this Gideon thing right. that, we, right. uh, that we see. It's going to be a good... Uh, <laughs> A good model for yeah. us. Speaking of uh, motivation, you should head over to Theonomous and p- 
put in a prayer request for the new year. Huh? Yes. Hey, yeah. You got. <laughs> you need to resolve yourself to right. uh, to stop doing whatever it is that you're doing that you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> we see you over there, Michael Brendan. Or, yeah. We see you. <laughs> hey, Brendan's been contributing. Yeah, he is. Uh, yeah, and he's not anonymous about it. He's like, this is me, and this is my problem. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Brendan, for being that way. Should we tell more the of viewers us viewers what? Should we tell the listeners what Brendan's problem is? Uh, no, I'll let them figure oh, it out. Okay, I'm, just, I'm joking, man. <laughs> go pray for Brendan. <laughs> yes, go pray for Brendan. That's great. Go no, pray for us all. Yeah, pray for all of us. That's and, right. And um, yeah, you make use of that site. Uh, right. We're we're now uh, sending it out pretty regularly. Yeah. And we had we've actually had a couple of new. Prayer requests. Ooh, this fresh meat. Week. Awesome. So that's good. That's good. So we actually had something to put on the yeah. newsletter this week. Good. And uh, so yeah, get out there. It's um, prayer dot theonot podcast dot com. Right. That's the theonymous page where you can uh, you can confess your faults anonymously if you want. Yes. If, if you just want prayers for whatever Anything. reason, for strength or for uh, for. You know, some maybe you're going through some tough times or whatever. Throw those up there too. I mean, yeah. we just want some content up there so that we can be actively praying for right. one another and loving. You got them. prayers. We want to pray. Yeah. So that's the thing. So, so uh, one Anyways. other thing to to throw out there is we just got a new T-shirt available. Yes, we did. I'm super <laughs> excited about this T-shirt. It's a donkey T-shirt. Yes, it's a donkey. So if you go. And listen to episode seventy. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll hear us talk about donkeys, right? And how we need to be donkeys, right? We were designed to be ambassadors for Christ, amen. Uh, and to be used uh, for Christ, yeah. And to carry Him, yes, in in, in to out to the world, right? That's right. So. Um, this, this shirt is a physical uh, representation of that. Right. Uh, it basically says, I'm a donkey for Jesus. Amen to that. <laughs> so That's awesome. I, yeah, I love that concept. Um, you can get that at holycubed.com. Holy cubed. And uh, also, we need to put some more... Uh, shirt. We talked about what was some of the other shirt ideas we had from the show. Oh, putting me on the spot here. Let me see. Well, maybe um, I wrote a book would be yeah. I wrote a book. Be a good be an one. awesome one. <laughs> Pope news. Yes. Yeah, some about the oh, Pope. And, yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I don't Throw know. that out there. Um, Michael and Brendan, y- y'all need to give us some uh, yeah. some ideas because we could do the same thing for some of your very memorable episodes with Finding Christ in Cinema. Right. Um, there's been a lot to, to talk about, and so maybe even some of those uh, those blurbs that get thrown out every week. I've got one. What's that? Santa Claus punching uh, uh, what's his name in the <laughs> face? Uh, Arius. Arius. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Punching Arius in the face. That'd be an awesome yeah, that's, t-shirt. that's pretty good. Heresy. <laughs> <laughs> so no heresy zone. No heresy zone. That's right. In every definition of the word. Yeah. Something about unity. We need to do one for unity. Yeah. Oh, so. we'll figure it out. Yeah. All right. So you want to dive on into the book of Judges again? Hey, man, bring it on. Yes, sir, Bob. The tomato. Yes. We're talking about Gideon. We're just moving through these judges. That's right. And um, and we come up to Gideon. And this one was a little surprising. Well, I mean, the story's not surprising. We know, we know the story. Um, but it, it was surprising for me the direction that we're going to end up going. Well, usually whenever we come to a Types and Shadows, which is what this is, right? We're, we're walking through Judges and we're looking Types and Shadows. Correct. Usually when we come up uh, with Types and Shadows, the Judges themselves are pictures of Christ. Christ, right? They're right. Christ types. Right. But Gideon is a strange story. Gideon, by the way, is my favorite judge. Like, out of all of the stories, Gideon's my favorite story. And I guess it just reminds me of me. Right? Yeah. And so... We can all relate if you really are honest with yourself. Exactly. And the more and more you look at it, the more you see the story of a Christian. His encounter with God and then the transforming power and what that does. Right? Yes. And so that's that's actually, I think, the overall... 
type and shadow of the story of right. Gideon. And that's why I say that it is a different direction, uh, is because I really wanted to see where Jesus was in Gideon. Sure. And, and I'm sure you could do it. Um, because, well, yeah. because Gideon is the deliverer. Right. But the way it plays out, it's almost like someone working through Gideon, right? Exactly. Which is more than now a model for Jesus working through us. Right. So uh, no, there won't be anything groundbreaking or new, I don't think, in, in what we look at. Um, We're just going to reiterate it. But I think, you know, what I think is so groundbreaking about that is – how miraculous it is that God uses us. And really, Gideon Gideon's a Christ type in the fact that Christ is found inside of Gideon. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. So, all right, so we'll get to it. Um, you want to start off by just telling the story? What do you want to do? Uh, sure. Yeah, we can we can do that. There's um, a lot of things to, to play in it. We're really looking at three chapters in the book of Judges. Yeah. Uh, chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 8. Right. Um, most of what we know about Gideon uh, right off the top of the head is going to come out of chapter 7. Right. But, um, but he does some more things other than this uh, Battle of the 300 that we'll, that we'll talk about. Um, so initially... Um, setting the stage for for Gideon. We are now, we've been delivered by Deborah, remember? Right. In the last time we did this, we talked about Deborah. And uh, so now, it seems like every time this happens, by the way, Judges is this on again, off again. Right. I think I used the term sinusoidal wave, (laughs) and it kind of freaked you out. (laughs) But, you know, I'm I'm an engineer. Yeah, that's right. Nerd. Uh, Go ahead. (laughs) But anyway, you've got this this thing at the uh, where there's peaks and valleys, right? In and it seems like there's this consistent move of forty years of of peace, forty years. That seems to be the breaking point, right? Before they just really screw up so much that God's like, "All right, I've had it here," and throws some distraction at them or some per- persecution at them, right? And that's what happens here. They've had forty years of goodness. Of no oppression, everything's good. Who needs God anyway now? Right. You know that type of thing. And then these Midianites show up. Now uh, the Midianites show up with the Amalekites, and they 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 kind of partner up. But anyway, these Midianites have been like harassing Israel now for seven years. Yeah. Well, they've been doing. They started out as small raid parties, right? So they go in and they'd raid your town and tear it up and yeah. steal your women and steal your food and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But it escalated so much to the point where Israelites couldn't function anymore. Yeah. They were they were being raided daily by the, the, the Midianites and there was nothing they could do about it. Uh, <laughs> they were just being, you know, tormented. It was like bad Bart riding into town every yeah. day shooting doing off. Doing a number six on them. Yeah, six guns and doing a number six on them. <laughs> That's a Blazing Saddles right? Whatever. reference. <laughs> so, Have you not seen Blazing Saddles? It's been so long since I've seen Blazing Saddles. Okay, I well, just remember... Uh, uh, like, d- disclaimer here, it's not the best... Christian movie. No, I'm sure that finding that oh that's a challenge right there. <laughs> finding Christ in cinema. Put this on the list. Blazing Saddles by Mel Brooks. I, I want that done. Any Mel Brooks movie. <laughs> Just do any. No, no, of no. Them. It has to be Blazing Saddles. Oh come on, there, Frankenstein. Yes, Young Frankenstein. Oh, no, Blazing Saddles is so far above and beyond that. I mean, it's like way, way out there. But anyway, yeah, the 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 number six thing. It was like they were trying to figure out how to get all these people out of town. Right. And Slim Pickens is like, oh, oh, I know, I know. We'll do a number six on them. <laughs> and, and Hetty is like, okay, what's a number six? He says, oh, watch where we go in the town. Wailing in the whopping every single thing that moves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it gets a little more graphic after that. But <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so anyway, the Midianites are pulling a number six. <laughs> Over and over and over again on the Israelites every day. It gets worse and worse and worse. Actually, uh, you find out a couple names of some Midianite leaders at the end. Um, and what I was reading before, I guess, is these guys had, quote-unquote, swift camels. So they were like the bl- bad barts yeah. of uh, of the Midianites. Wailing right? in a wall. Every single person that moves. Right. <laughs> 
So they come in and they just raid. And so it got to where it was so bad that the Israelites couldn't do anything out in public. Uh, well, actually, the story begins and you find Gideon himself in a wine press threshing wheat. Yes. Which makes no sense. <laughs> Because wine presses are for pressing grapes to Correct. make wine. Right. Why in the world is he threshing wheat? Why isn't he out, you know, threshing wheat outdoors where mm. the chaff can come up and blow away? So it's not very good for yeah. what he's doing. They're all hiding out. Yeah. Basically, he's hiding, right, yeah. in the in the wine press. He's afraid of the Gideon, uh, Gideon, wow, the Midianites coming in and raiding his wheat. Yeah. Okay. So that's where the story begins. Yeah. Now, it's also fair to, to mention that the reason why this judgment is upon them is because they've lost their minds. Yes. As far as their service to God. They, they're they off the, the rails again. They've erected all these these idols and all this sort of thing. It talks about uh, one of the things that Gideon gets charged with is destroying the idols, which is really kind of cool when you think about it here they are being oppressed by this raiding force and god's instruction his initial instructions were it had nothing to do with fighting the enemy yeah it had to do with cleaning house yeah and so that was what he was doing is it tearing down the 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 uh idols right. that were that were erected um <laughs> No pun intended, because these are going to be phallic type of things. That's very true. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Okay. Well, that, seriously, they were. That's, that's right. That's, that's the type of, of paganism we're talking about here. Exactly. And uh, is is it talks about him tying uh, these things to a cart and to his ox and pulling them over. Like, right. you know, so this is a, a big deal. Yeah. So. And, yeah, you bring up a point. Basically, they'd have... They had they had peace for forty years. They had no problems. Everything was hunky dory, mm -hmm. right? And so they were almost like America today, mm -hmm. right? You said that before the show, which is totally true. They're they're a lot like yeah, America. While we're talking about types and shadows, right? right. They uh, you know they they call themselves God's people, mm -hmm. but really they have no reason to pray to God. Yeah. Because nothing's wrong, so they're just hanging out and they start partying with the rest of the yeah, might uh, as well, the rest of the people. Might as well do you know when in Rome exactly. <laughs> and so it was a lot easier and a lot more fun to yeah. you know to to worship their gods because they they got a lot of fun out of it. So, anyways, um, well, and it didn't upset their wives. That's right. They were marrying into these cultures and et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. And it was a lot easier to keep peace in the home just to keep the idol there. Right. So, so all right. So the angel of the Lord plays a huge part in this. Yeah. Right. In verse eleven, the angel of the Lord came and he sat under the oak that was in. Oprah. <laughs> Didn't know we were going to talk about her today, did you? No, Oprah, uh, the oak which is an Oprah, uh, that belonged to Joash uh, and uh, the Ab Abizarite. Which I didn't study him. Did you study anything about him? Did not. Oh, I wonder. Okay. His the, sons. And, and, well, there's another disclaimer. There is so much in this story. Oh, yeah. I'm sure there are types that we could really pull out in all these names. There's right. tons of names in this, in this story. Yeah. So, so okay. His son, Gideon, mm -hmm. um, was threshing wheat in the wine vat in order to hide it from the Midianites, okay? So we have this angel of the Lord. Now, whenever we read angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, um, I believe it's it's Christ. Could be a theophany. Okay, it's a yes. theophany. And uh, what that means is it's Christ appearing in the Old Testament right, to, mm -hmm. a, uh, to, to somebody. So... Um, he appears to Gideon. And Sometimes Gideon's we just need to do an episode on theophanies. Yeah, that'd that be good. Because there's a lot of places in right. the Old Testament that could be attributed to Christ prior to his actual sure. human form. Sure. Okay, so he finds Gideon, and why is Gideon, Gideon inside this place? Because he's afraid of the Midianites. Right. He has fear all in him, okay? And the very first thing that the Lord says What's he says addressed as? I just, I love it because it's so funny. And I think it's, part of me goes, all right, this is totally cocky. All right, so the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, the Lord be with you, mighty warrior. 
<laughs> mighty man of valor, yeah. right? And okay, so why why in the world would he call Gideon of all people uh, a mighty warrior, a mighty man of valor? Uh, he's in the middle of of hiding, right? Right. A man of valor <laughs> doesn't hide. <laughs> a, a warrior doesn't thresh his wheat in a wine press. And so, so you think he's being um, facetious? Facetious? I, I part or do of you me, think there's something else going on there. Part of me does because I think God has a sense of humor, and I think that'd be really funny for Jesus to come up and go, "Hey, mighty man of valor," <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> right. But the other part of me says, "You know what? There's something in here because the Lord is about to transform this man. What what God sees mm-hmm. in this person is different from what He even sees Amen. in Himself, right? And it's different from what anybody else sees in Him. God sees a warrior inside this." Coward, yes, yes. Right? and that's how I, I. I think that Gideon takes it the way that you were first talking about it, right? Because on the surface, it sounds facetious. It sounds it sarcastic, right? Um, because you know, like I'm reading the NET, and it uses the term. Uh, he, uh, he says, "The Lord is with you, courageous warrior." <laughs> And obviously, this man's not a warrior. He doesn't right. see himself as a warrior. He's he doesn't want anything to do with war at this point. He's like you said, he's hiding out. And but I think God sees something in him that he sees the potential of what Gideon can be through God. Yeah. Or so it's not. It's not that you're this great man, but you are if I'm with you. Yeah. So you you are every one of us is a courageous warrior if the, the if the king is inside of us, if if the the greatest warrior ever is inside of us, right? And um, so look at uh, Gideon's response yeah. to him. I I love the way Gideon responds because this is the human thing. This right. is what we all do all the time. Sure. Uh, Gideon says to him, pardon me. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> but if the Lord is with us, why has such disaster overtaken us? Mm. Where are all his miraculous deeds of our ancestors told us about? They said, did the Lord not bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Okay, so it's all God's fault. Yeah. That's and, and this is the big question that we that gets asked all the time. Why would God allow this? Why would God allow that? Where was God in all this problems or whatever? Well, if we get the the beauty of seeing the story of the book of Judges from a bird's eye view, we've seen the past forty years, and we saw what happened before, and we saw what happened before that forty years, and we've seen the state that Israel is has gotten themselves in. So every time someone gets themselves into a pickle, then all of a sudden it's where is God? Right. So uh, it's so natural here that they've spent forty years in peace, not concerning themselves too much about God at all. But yet now, when things get hard, now it becomes this question, let's blame God for this. Pardon me. (laughs) When he says the first words out of his mouth was, the Lord is with you, he says, well, pardon me. But where exactly? Because I don't see it. I'm not seeing the evidence of what you're saying. And um, so I think this is is really a good model for us. Right. Gideon and the Israelites, that's a great model for how we are as humans. Right. Uh, God says, I see great things in you, and I am with you. And we turn around and say, where? I don't see you in me. I don't see you in this. I don't see – there's too much tragedy here. There's too much – how can you be in this? Mm. And um, – Right. <clears throat> so – Okay, so his response brings the Lord's response, right? Yes, yes. And, and the Lord says to him, all right, this might that you have of yours, go in it, right? <laughs> and you're going to save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? Okay? Mm-hmm. So, okay, so at this point, Gideon has no clue really who he's talking to. Right. 
Okay, he doesn't know that he's the, he's the angel of the Lord. He has, we'll, we'll see that his doubts are all over the place. Right. Okay, and he's still you know confused about this whole situation. My my thinking is he probably thinks he's a prophet of some sort, mm-hmm. but he doesn't think that he's an angel of the Lord because this this prophet's giving him command. Uh, I'm I'm sending you out to fight Midian. Right. right? All right. So. Uh, well, hang on a second. First, I want to n- to notice one thing that okay. that in in this response to Gideon, <clears throat> his question was, "Where what where are you, God? I don't I don't see you here. I don't see you with us." Yeah, and good, his response yeah. was, "I am in you. Have have I not sent you?" Right. So, in other words, don't be pointing the finger at me. You're my representative here. Yeah. You're the one. You're the one that makes a difference. That has that has allowed this situation to exist. Sure. Not me. Right. And I think that is ultimately when people start asking the question why, that is the answer. Well, why did you let it happen? Right. God has has given you charge of this. That's He's right. put this in your hands. What are you doing with it? Right. And then that brings Gideon's response again. <laughs> Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. Take note of verse 15 here, because this is a, a great evidence of, of uh, the type and shadow that we're, we're pulling out of this, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, he is. He's the weakest in Manasseh and the least in his father's house. Gideon realizes who he is, mm-hmm. right? Yes. He, he realizes he's, he's a nothing. Okay, um, and then the Lord says, "But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man." Okay, so uh, the Lord gives him gives him this pronunciation that he's going to be with him, and he's going to strike down the Midianites. Uh, Gideon goes, "All right, hold on, real quick. Uh, why don't I go? Please don't apart from here until I uh, present." something set for you so Gideon goes and he gets some food and drink right right to set before this what he thinks is probably a prophet Mm -hmm. okay because he wants to you know give him something for his his pronunciation I believe so all right so Gideon goes in the house prepares unleavened bread and uh, and broth and and uh, and some uh, meat right and he brings it out and he sets it on a rock before the before the the, uh, the the angel of the angel of the Lord or the prophet as he thinks it is, right? And uh, man, where did I, I just lost it? But okay, um, oh. she brought the food to him. That's right, under the oak tree and presented it to him. I know. I my verse uh, twenty. Yeah, my uh, <laughs> my browser just closed on me. Oh, so, okay, well, good. I, would, I can read it. Uh, God's messenger said to him, "Yeah, put the meat and unleavened bread on this rock and pour out the broth. And Gideon did as instructed. The Lord's messenger touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of his staff, and fire flared up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread, and the Lord's messenger then disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. Yeah. So God, God what a weird this. response! Exactly, Let me burn that and then exactly. disappear. So this whole thing, where basically what God's doing is showing His power, it's right? Like Tim the it's Enchanter. Like... <laughs> I've never thought. Of... <laughs> you know when he takes the stab, he's like, <laughs> <laughs> he's just shooting it all. Okay, anyway, so Gideon. As soon as like... that happens, <laughs> right? I wonder if Gideon and his dad were like golf clap. <laughs> Oh man, <laughs> so funny now. <laughs> oh, mine's gone. Okay, verse twenty-two. Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord. Right. This yes. is where Gideon yes. realizes, oh my gosh, I've been in the presence of of the Lord. Right. Yes. Alas, O oh Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face, which is the natural response for anybody who ever sees God face to face or the Lord face to face. First thing I think is Scared I'm gonna death. die. Uh, right. Right. And. Uh, uh, the Lord has said to him, "Peace be to you. Do not fear. You won't die. Hey, man, you're not going to die. Chill. Okay. So this is for me. This is Gideon's conversion experience. Yes. Right. Yes. We can liken this to a Christian's conversion experience. Mm-hmm. God goes down. He finds the least of these. This man who is nothing." 
and he takes and he appears before him and says, "I in you am going to do a miraculous work." Yes, right. And our response is, "Oh, we've we've seen you, right? And we're going to die. Mm-hmm. I repent. My sin is messed up." In fact, we see this in the Apostle Paul. Oh yeah, is it is this not basically the same exact thing that happened to oh, yeah. Saul of Tarsus when he was on the road to Damascus? That's good. When he actually saw Jesus and then even doubted, "Who are you? What are you doing here?" And and, and of course, whenever he says, "Why are you persecuting me?" and all this, it became clear who this guy was, and of course, Paul falls on his face in repentance. Right. That's right. And he says basically the same thing. I'm going to show you, he tells Ananias, I, I will show him what he will have to suffer for my sake. Yes. I'm going to show him what he's going to suffer for me. I'm going to make him my whipping boy pretty much. But that's so true. And All right, so Gideon, he has this experience where he's totally convert, converted. The very first thing Gideon does is he worships God. Yes. Right? He builds an altar and he calls it uh, he calls it the Lord of Peace or um, um, Yahweh Shalom. Okay, the Lord of Peace. So, what does God do to us? He gives us. He takes away the fear. He takes away the anguish. He takes away the hurt, and he gives us peace. So, those questions that Gideon had, mm-hmm. right? God gives him peace. Yes, uh, in the midst of that. And notice what he says there. He says, um, "The Lord is on friendly terms with me." It's such a simple right. um, state, but to think about it, it whenever he was in a place mm-hmm. where he was questioning, is God really with me? And now he sees, wow, I'm friends with this guy. Right. We're, we're, we're buddies. Yeah. And, and of course, then he, he, he gives, gives him this charge right. to go uh, destroy okay, now that a bunch we're buddies. of idols. Go take down your father's <laughs> idols, right? Yeah. Cut down the Asherah pole, <laughs> uh, pull down the altar of Baal, right? Yeah. Um, and so Gideon does yeah. this, but I think it's important to note he does it with ten men in the middle of the night. Yes. Which which is a statement of his faith still. Right. Gideon, I mean, just because he has this conversion experience, mm-hmm. he's still shaky the entire way through the book. Yes. Right? He still, he still questions God. He still struggles yes. with this and, doubt. And that's one thing that we always have, have got to deal with is that... Christians aren't perfect people, right. and they should a should not see themselves as such, and b should not be looked upon as such. They're not this holier than thou thing is a bunch of bunk. That in reality we're broken people yeah. that happen to know a doctor, and so th- this is is a perfect example of God says go. Jesus says, follow me, and we try and figure out, okay, what's the path of least resistance to still be able <laughs> to follow him and still go, but but <laughs> I want to still save face a little bit because I'm, I'm afraid to do this in the light of day. So I'm going to get a few trusted men, and we're going to go out here, we're going to lasso this phallic pole, <laughs> pull it down, <laughs> Right, <laughs> and uh, so, <laughs> so, so you see here that that he um, <laughs> then he hides, right? He yes. hides from it, like he's afraid the backlash that's going to happen. The townspeople come out and they're like, "Who's tore down our altars? Who's <laughs> who's destroyed this stuff?" And Joash, his father, has to come out and defend him. Yes, right. And and I, I think this is part uh, cool the way his dad does defend him yeah um they said um verse 31 or verse, verse 30 30 they said bring your son so we can execute him yeah he pulled down the bail altar and cut down the nearby asherah pole <laughs> and uh <laughs> joash said to all those who confronted him 
must you fight Baal's battles? Right. So in other words, this is a god, right? Yeah. Isn't this a god that you're supposed to be worshiping? Right. You've got to do all the fighting for him. He can't go, he can't go do that himself. If he's really a god, it says, let him fight his own battles. Right. So after all, it was his altar that was pulled down. And that very day, Gideon's father named him Jerubbaal. Yep. So this was Gideon's nickname. It became Jerubbaal, which means let Baal fight with him, for it is his altar that was pulled down. Yeah. Do we have anywhere else in Scripture where a Christian, after conversion, is given a new name? Hmm. Well, we did mention Saul of Tarsus. <laughs> right. How about Peter? Yeah, it's a common thing. Right. Yeah, Cephas. Cephas. And, oh, uh, Cephas. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it seems like it, it seems like this is a common thing, and even us, we, That's right. when we wear the name Christian, Christian, that is our new name. Our new name. We're wearing His name, Little Christ. Mm-hmm. And so this is again, this is a, a shadow of of of, uh, of a man who was fearful and uh, lost completely. Mm-hmm. Right, getting getting stronger and becoming, and this is the you know this is a lot of the turning point. Right, he, he does what God calls him to do. Right. He does it in the middle of the night, but yes. he does it, yes. and he's starting to to work up this this truth inside him that God actually is with him, and he does have peace. Yeah, right? well, and also think about this in terms of uh, when you go out there and you do something, even if it's in the middle of the night for God. It still co- brings attention to you, negative attention to you. And what was what was he trying to do by doing this at night? He was trying to reduce the damage. That's right. He was trying to do damage, damage control, control. Uh-huh. on what he was doing. Right. But did it work? Ultimately, no. No. They still. He it, was outed. It says they knew the next day. They right. figured it out. It didn't take long to, to figure out right. who did it. Right. And so, you know, you can't hide this stuff. What is it that Jesus says? Does a man light a candle and then put it under a bushel? Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Little. That's good. It's <laughs> good foreshadowing. Yeah. Yes. So, <laughs> but the Excellent. point. But the point there being, do you do you hide your light? Or do you let it shine in that's the daylight? Right. And so that's that's where he's getting to. Exactly. So Gideon gets a little, pretty bold here. Now, at the, during this point, the Midianites, the Amalekites, they cross the Jordan, and they're camping in the Valley of Jezreel. So they're about to go up. Yeah. For battle, okay. This is going to be funny a, how they always end up in this Jezreel Valley. Yeah, you ever think about that? The Battle of Ar- Armageddon. Yeah, that's that's the valley. Getting it on. That's the Valley of Armageddon, and there's all these battles that always seem to. T- the last one we talked about, right, was in the Valley of Jezreel. Valley of Jezreel. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So okay. So as soon as that happens, the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon. The Bible says the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon. Mm-hmm. Right? He sounded the trumpet, and the Abizarites were called to follow him. He sent messengers throughout all Manasseh. They too were called to follow him. He sent messengers to Asher, to Zebulun, to Nephtali, and he went out to meet them. Then Gideon said to them, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I am laying a fleece of wood, a <laughs> fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone and it is dry on the ground, I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand as you have said. Okay? So, again, we see mightiness in Gideon calling all these people to himself. Yes, yes. And then he reverts back again. And he goes, oh, okay, wait, 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 wait. wait. All right, I need another sign here, and, God. And, and think about this. This could be still a numbers thing in his mind, which is really going to be ironic. <laughs> yeah. Because I think what he's thinking is, we find out later, he's gathered about 30, over 30,000 people. Right. Now, that is a feat in and of itself. Sure. That he was able to get these people who were apostate, he was a, he was able to gather 30,000 of them. Right. This dude was doing some, he was hitting the bushes. Man. Yeah. Serious campaigning. But once he got this number of people, then he looked at their numbers. Yeah. <laughs> and it paled in comparison. Right. And so and I think that that's where the doubt started kicking sure. in. Sure. And the it, rubber met the road. I think it's a natural thing 
for us to doubt, Mm -hmm. even with the Spirit of God upon us. Yes. It's a natural thing for us to doubt because we still have that human nature. Make sure you're with me. If I'm going to do this, yes, I need you. I can't make sure you're there. And and, and so let's test this. I just, I got to know. Right. I got to know for sure. (laughs) <laughs> right. So the uh, he lays out the fleece, right? And God does what, what he has to do. He makes the fleece wet. And leaves the ground and dry. And leaves the ground dry so much that he wrings out a whole bowl full of water from the fleece, right? Yeah. So then Gideon's like, wait, wait, wait. Okay, let's try this again. <laughs> So this time you that make, was good. That yeah, was good. You make the ground wet and the fleece dry, and then I'll 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 know for sure, God, that it's you. Okay. Yeah. So he does it, and God is very gracious, and he does this. Um, I read a type and shadow thing that the yeah. That sounds I, thought, I thought this was really cool. Go ahead. Kind of interesting. Was, so uh, imagine. Okay. So, so type within a type. A type with yeah. <laughs> type within a type. So water is often used as a, a picture, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Correct. Okay. Um, um, and out of you, out of your belly will flow rivers of water. Right, exactly. So we have this this picture of the Holy Spirit being water. Now imagine this: this is a a fleece of wool, a lamb's fleece. Mm-hmm. Okay. What other lamb do we know of in Scripture? Mm. The main lamb, <laughs> behold, is the Lamb of God. Right, that takes away the sins. Takes of the away world. the sins of the world. Okay. So the Holy Spirit, the first night, falls upon the Lamb. But the world is dry, Mm -hmm. right? Which is dead. And when John baptized him, he saw descending upon him the Holy Spirit Spirit as a dove. Right. So the next morning, he has the fleece that's full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, all of his works were done by the Holy Spirit's work, Mm -hmm. right? So the next night... The the fleece is laid down and it's bone dry, a symbol for death. Mm. And the Holy Spirit or the water falls upon the world. Yeah, it's a symbol wow. of Christ giving. That's really cool. The Holy Spirit to the world, mm. which is really neat. You know, you never thought of that. Because you always wonder why in the world, Lord, did you do that? Would you make him do that and, twice? And think about this: you've got water in the wool, right? What does Gideon do? By Gideon's hand, by the hand of a man, right? That water was wrung out. Yeah. So, mm. so it's like the, wow. the wool was made dry by the hands of man, man. Mm. and then it. But then it didn't stop there. No, it instead fell upon the world. Exactly. That's cool. So you, you have that whole story of the fleece in there, which to me is a type of shadow of the Holy Spirit falling upon the world. So here's Gideon with his thirty-one thousand men. Is that right? Thirty-two. 32,000 men. All right, you tell this next part. Go ahead. All right. So, <laughs> I've been so talking too much. And I don't have any water up here. <laughs> okay, so you got you got 32,000 people that have answered the call. Right. Okay. And uh, this is another thing that could be a type within a type, but we'll we'll get to that. Right. So, you got 32,000 people here and God's like, mm, I don't like those odds." He was like, "Hey, I don't like them either." <laughs> Yeah. No, 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 you don't get it. I don't like you got too many people. So here's the first culling. Here's what we're going to do. You ask anyone who is afraid for their life and doesn't really want to be there just to go on home. <laughs> Dude, 22,000 of the 32,000 abandon him and leave. Okay, so that leaves 10,000. Uh, God's still not happy with these odds. Uh, and here's w- what I think th- th- is really cool about this, because we see this in our lives all the time, is people can trust what they see. People have faith in what they can see, they, they, yeah. what they can handle, what they Tangible. can... Tangible. Right, what they can get their hands around. And we've even gra- got great stories in our own history of wars right. won by small armies against large armies. But where does all the credit go to the leader of the Amen. army and to the, the training of those soldiers or whatever? The, you still have this uh, the, the issue of who gets the credit. And this is a big issue of, of, of dealing with pride, man, the pride of man. And uh, so what does, what does God want to do here? He mm. wants to make this, these odds so impossible right. that, um, that there's no way man could take any credit for it whatsoever. So um, 
what he does is he gives him one other test. He takes this uh, 10,000 and he says, make them go down and, and drink some of uh, drink out of, of the, uh, the river there. And he said the ones that lap from it uh, out of their hands, uh, they'll be the ones that you keep. The ones who kneel down and drink straight from it, they're the ones that you need to send home. So uh, <laughs> this happens there in uh, verse 4 of chapter 7. Right. Um, verse 6 tells us. Is it verse 6? Yep. Yeah, 300 men lapped. The rest of the men kneeled to drink water. Um, and the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men who lapped, I will deliver the whole army, and I will hand Midian over to you. The rest of the men should go home. Um, so it's, it, to me, it is real interesting that, um, that he whittled this down to 300. Uh, we've got this... This similar story in our own history, the Spartans of Thermopylae, oh, yeah, the, the Battle of Thermopylae, uh, which was made into this crazy movie, uh, which was kind of historically inaccurate, but <laughs> but but whatever. Uh, there were 300 right. soldiers involved in that war. However, they weren't victorious. <laughs> That's right. They lost. <laughs> they lost. Uh, but the what, what is that picture even? What is the film supposed to do? It's supposed to bring up. It's about honor and valor right. and dying for what you believe in and all that that sort of thing. Um, Imagine if they would were able to actually conquer the Persian army, not just the the battle, but the entire thing. army. Yeah, yeah, that they were to 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 take that. It would have been tremendous. Right. Well, that's exactly what happens here. Sure. What we're going to see, and God is foretelling this that with these three hundred people, I am going to work a miraculous victory that that you cannot take any credit for. Right. And the the shadow, the type that that I pull from this and this is okay so disclaimer uh, I'm, I'm not saying that uh, this is 100% accurate or anything <laughs> but who does I, I will say this I believe this is a good type and shadow of, of the early Christians okay um, with a handful of Christians God conquers the world with his message. Yes. As it says there, uh, they turned the world upside down. Yeah. And uh, these weren't, you know, this wasn't a, a huge thing. And and and, uh, and over and over in, in the New Testament, uh, we see God using the simple-minded, the weak, the, the nothing, the smallest yes. to, to beat the biggest. Just to show. And we see this over and over in Scripture, too. David and Goliath is yeah. a big one. But... Over and over and over, God wants to show his power through the small ones. I also see this is a type of God taking away the chaff from the wheat. Okay. In that, I believe, I believe that those that claim Christ today are a lot more than those who really have Christ. Uh, right. And that's what I was meaning by this could be a type within the sure. a type is because there's constantly these uh, references through parables of the wheat and the tares is a good example. Right. Uh, the fish in the net that, you know, that they'll dwell together. And, it, you know, and uh, when you read those kingdom parables, which, by the way, those are in Matthew 13. If right. you, if you want to study those, it's a great study. Notice that it, sa it keeps saying things like the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that right. pulls in all these fish. It doesn't say the world is like a net. And I think most of the time we think in our minds that this net is full of worldly people and Christians, and he calls out all the worldly people. Right. That's not what it says. Right. It says the kingdom of heaven. In other words, the church is like this net right. that pulls in all these fish. However, on the final day, 
the the, the calling will be. will happen then. Exactly. That, that those ones that aren't true, that aren't good fish, are are tossed out. And it's not your job to do the calling, by the way. <laughs> yes, uh, the fish aren't supposed to be kicking the other fish out of the <laughs> net. Right. Exactly. Let God do the do, do the, the calling. calling. And true. it's the same way with the wheat and the tares. There's even the question. Uh, the workers say, "Oh, should we go out? Uh, should we should we go out and 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 cut out all them tares?" Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> because you're gonna do the damage. damage. You're gonna right. be, you're gonna be messing things up if you try to do this. This, yeah. is, this is the harvester's That's job. That's God's work, right? And but man, boy, we do want to do our own culling, don't we? Right. I mean, we <laughs> and this isn't again. This isn't Gideon weeding out these people. This is God weeding them out. Right. Right. And and, and he didn't do it based on. Uh, how good they were, like on um, amongst themselves. Right. Like, like look at what he he used. He used a simple water drinking. How you drink? How do you drink your water? Right. Um. And notice that it's not based on instruction. It's not like Gideon said, "Okay, I want you guys to lap the water from your hand." Right. He didn't say that. Right. He just carefully observed to see which ones did did this. So it was God's ability to choose the ones that, right. that he knew he could use. Right. The ones that were probably not the most valiant. They probably weren't the strongest. They probably weren't the most equipped soldiers of the bunch either. Right. They were probably... They probably know, the worst equipped. Yeah. Just like Gideon himself, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> when you look at that, all right. So moving along. Okay, so he he didn't he then. I, I love the way v- verse nine is worded. Okay. Uh, that night, the Lord said to Gideon, "Get up and attack the camp, for I am handing it over to you." Yep. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> you just knocked me down to three hundred people, and your plan is go get them, go get them, <laughs> go get them, buddy, go get them. They're all yours. <laughs> <laughs> he says, but if you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and listen to what they're saying. Now, this is really cool to me because we can look at this a couple of different ways. Um, when we started this little journey, Gideon was full of doubt. So much so that he kept demanding signs from God. We don't really get that right here. We, we Gideon has been loyal to do what God is telling him to do at this point. He's he's whittled his army down. He's down to three hundred people. He's been very observant to what God has has told him to do. Right. And it's almost like bef- it's like God knew their hearts before they even knew it themselves. Sure. Because he was like, okay, look, I need you to go down and attack these people, but I know that you're struggling. I know it. <laughs> and so here's what I'm going to do. I am going to equip you for the service that I'm calling you for. Right. Now, this is very similar to how God uses us today. We have a task set before us. Go get them, tiger. But at the same time, we feel inadequate. Sure. We have these these self doubts. We have doubt in God. All all this stuff inside of us. But he's saying, look, I'm there and I'm about to equip you for whatever the task is at hand. Right. And so that's exactly what he does. He gives them the opportunity to go and spy into the camp. Right. And listen to what these people are saying. And what do they hear? <laughs> they hear about a dream yeah. that one of the soldiers is having about a piece of bread rolling down the hill and knocking down the camp. And um, in their discussion about what this dream is supposed to mean, one of them actually names Gideon. Yeah. Well, I think that could be that little Gideon guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. So yeah, and they're in the enemy camp listening to this, right? Mm-hmm, they're right. hearing this, yeah, from about Gideon. I mean, if that doesn't strengthen you, nothing will. So Gideon, you know, and it's just like God to continue strengthening the people for the task at hand. Yes, and that's exactly what He did here. So Gideon gets his gumption up and sets this plan in motion. And I have one more real interesting type. I think, or a shadow, a picture here. Um, 
He divided up the three, verse, six, verse 16. He divided up the 300 men into three companies and put trumpets into their hands, all of them in empty jars with torches inside the jars. Now, this is the hiding your candle in our buffet, right? <laughs> and he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me. Then blow the trumpets also on every side and all the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch when they had just set the watch. They blew the trumpets, smashed the jars that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars and in their left hand and the torches in their right hands and the trumpets to blow and they cried out a sword for the lord and for gideon every man stood up in his place around the camp and all the army ran they cried out and fled when they blew the 300 trumpets the lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army the army fled as far as beth shit and shitta towards zara zarara sorry and as far as the border of abel mahola by Tabith. And the men of Israel who were camped out from Naphtali and from Asher and all Manasseh, they pursued after Midian. So what happens here? They surround the camp. Mass confusion. Mass confusion. But what does Gideon arm his people with? Two things. Mm -hmm. A trumpet and a candle. <laughs> right? <laughs> a trumpet and a light. From a bunch of guys who are very apt at uh, licking from their hands. Exactly. Yeah. Okay? So what can we get here as a symbol? I think Christians are armed with two things. Mm -hmm. Right? We, we go out proclaiming Christ with our trumpet, mm -hmm. and we shine the light in the darkness. Right. And God exactly. God does the rest. God does the work. Exactly. And and so first off, ask yourself a question. What good did this do? When they broke those jars <laughs> and they blew the trumpets and they shouted, what exactly did that do? A lot of people think, oh, well, it confused the camp. No, God okay, confused the camp. These are trained warriors. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Prepared to take a nation, right? I don't think... A few candles are going to spook them, right? But notice what it says that 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 um, that happens. Um, let's see, where was the verse I was looking at? Um, when the three hundred men blew their trumpets, this is verse twenty-two. The Lord caused the Midianites to attack one another with their swords. Right. Okay. Now, I don't care how confusing it is to look up in the middle of a dead sleep. You're not going to stab your buddy next to right. you. Right. <laughs> and you say, did you see those candles on the ridge? <laughs> and then stab your friend. This is God at work. Um, the point being that the 300, this was about their faith. It wasn't necessarily about what they were doing that made the difference. God wanted to see them go into it with faith, knowing that God would do the work. Right. And that's exactly what happened. And then, of course, they w were able to um, to pursue them. And it looks like some of these other people that had called and had gone away, maybe, uh, the the ones who were camped in uh, Naphtali and Asher and Manasseh, right. they all answered the call at that point. Right. And they began to, to uh, make this pursuit. Um, so uh, anyway, the part of of the victory really comes in uh, verse. Look, I guess it's twenty two to twenty five, where um, where they were chasing down the commanders, right? Uh, Oreb and Zeb, <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, I was trying to f find some symbology in their. Um, in in their names, um, but I don't know. I couldn't find any s symbolic reference there that that they mean what crow or raven, raven and wolf and wolf. There's not um, a lot of symbol uh, sim symbolic symbolic uh, symbolism there. Yeah. But I mean, you can you can look and see. Uh, you know, God uses men like Gideon to out the wolves that the that hurt the church, which is. Great, right, right, right. But other than that, I, and the ravens do come and and 
carry the seed away. Exactly. So, you they're know, the these are crushed by him. Servants of the wicked. Right. And so they, there's so this, they're both wicked yeah. uh, symbols. Yeah. In chapter 8, there's this huge saga at the end where Gideon now, in, incensed with the Lord, basically chases them down. Yes. Doesn't quit. The people of Ephraim go, what in the world have you done to us? You know, you, you fought Gideonites. Are you crazy? They're going to come and destroy us. Right. And Gideon, or the Midianites, they're going to come and destroy Gideon's like, uh, I did this because this is what we're supposed to do because the Lord has given him our hands. Yeah. So he's incensed. He, he does this. He finally chases them all down. He kills them. But what I love is the end, uh, verse 22, whenever it's all said and done, they come to Gideon. Right, mm-hmm. and the the men of Israel said to Gideon, "Rule over us, you and your son and your grandson also. You have saved us from the hand of Midian." Right? Yeah. So they so come after to him. the fact, everybody's cool. That's right. But but you know what I think is also interesting is getting up right before that part. Uh, you've got this whole thing happening with um, with he defeats Oreb and Zeb. At uh, the rock and yeah. the wine press, they're both killed, and uh, he takes their heads as symbols, basically, right. and and continues the pursuit. Now he's still got his three hundred <laughs> people, and they're pursuing others. And here's what's interesting: is everyone wants credit. That's kind of what's going on at this point going forward. Everyone's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You didn't let us know? We could have gotten involved. We could have had a hand in this. We could have been part of your army. And uh, so it's like, what happens today? Right. It's like everybody wants a piece of the credit. And that's exactly what God was trying to stop from happening. So it's, it's, it's affirmation after the fact to Gideon that this is why we only have 300 people. Right. Um, also, um, oh, which also can go into, um, I, 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 I don't know what to think necessarily. I've never been a member of what I would consider a um, mega church. <laughs> yeah. But I kind of get the idea that this these concepts can come into play a little bit. That you can be more effective on a smaller and more uh, intimate basis right. than having this large crowd. And um, so I love to hear it when these mega churches do like uh, life groups and where they actually do life together in small groups because that seems to be where uh, there's a lot of effectiveness. But notice that in this pursuit, they were chasing down a couple of um, of standouts, insurgents that were left, um, and they stopped at a place called Sukkoth and asked the people there if they would lend a hand in apprehending these guys. Right. And their response is, "You've already got the heads of o- Oreb and Zeb, so what do you? <laughs> we're not going to mess with you." Right. And. Um, Gideon's like, oh, I'll come back and lash you with some thorns for that one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so then they move on to this other town, Peniel. And same thing. They get the same type of thing. They get no assistance. Instead, they get uh, chided. And I think this, this could also be somewhat of a type of what it's like to pursue righteousness right. to pursue these things and you are constantly in persecution like even when you, when people can see the good that is being done there's still this level sure. of persecution coming from people that are supposed to be allies people that are supposed to be your friends and neighbors and countrymen and all this sort of thing so there is a persecution that can happen from within right a unwillingness to support the work um you can't let that get you down. And I, I know that in in the time of judges, we're dealing with retribution real time. Okay, so there are some things that happen here. They do catch these guys, and on the way back, <laughs> Gideon makes good on his promise. Right. He st- stops by at Succoth, and he grabs the elders there and, and wears them out and uh, kills them and does the same thing at uh Peniel, and right. but you know once again they, we were under an old covenant at this point. Uh, this is the type of thing that is is going to happen ultimately in the end. Right. Uh, 
<laughs> we as as Gideons don't need to be um, executing those that persecute us, but but that will come to um, those that do get in the way of the Lord's work that are oppressing those that are are uh, working for for God. Right. Um, there in the end of it. Oh um, yeah. As you were talking about it, he refuses the kingship basically and he says yes. the Lord will be your God. Yes. Which is awesome. He you know, he does that. But then there's this whole thing with the ephod. Right. You ever studied that? Yeah. What, explain that to me. I'm okay. interested. So <laughs> and, and I I, I, tr- I chalk this up to Gideon's na- naivete. Yeah. Okay. So Gideon what is the first thing Gideon did whenever he realized that the messenger was from God. He he set up an altar. Right. It's the first thing he he wanted to worship. He wanted to praise. He wanted to say, "This is my friend, and I am. Uh, I got to do something about it." Right. Now, this is a natural thing. We have Peter doing the same thing at the Mount of Transfiguration. Hey, you know what we need? We need some some tabernacles here, right. and and we'll set one up for you, and one up for Moses, and one up for Elijah, and and so. This is a natural thing. Right. Okay, so what does he do? He says, here's what I want to do. Yeah. He's like, you guys have taken a lot of spoil, and a lot of that is include gold. Just give me the earrings. Just give me the gold earrings you got. We're going to melt it down. Right. We're going to do something for God. Okay? We're going to pay back. We're going to do something. And so what does he do? He builds this thing. God never asks him to, God doesn't way. ask him to. This is coming from him. Right. He, But he, he, has, a, he has good intentions. And the, the idea was, I am going to build this thing, and that it is going to be a, a remembrance of what God has done. Um, however, people are people. And these are people who had been conditioned to worshiping idols. Right. And so this ephod became uh, a problem. He uh, he put it in his hometown of Ophrah, and um, all the Israelites. It says all the Israelites prostituted went a horn. I love the I love the, <laughs> the King James there because it says they went a horn. Does it really say that? Yeah. Wow. They went a horn again. <laughs> with it's it. like oh okay. <laughs> We'll do that. So the poles are back. Yep. Um, so the Israelites prostituted themselves to it by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. Mm-hmm. So in hindsight, probably wasn't the best thing to do because it caused problems. Right. It caused people to once again fall back into the place where they're worshiping them in idols. Whether they were considered, whether it was considered a false god, probably not. But they were probably raising up Gideon and his. Well, and yeah, and here's the thing. Okay, so who wears the ephod that's actually declared by God? The priests. The high priest, right. right? And so the people were supposed to go and infer from the high priest right. on what to do. And now all of a sudden there's this Gideon character, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. he has his own ephod. Right. So. It kind of puts him in a position, right, where people are coming and and they're you know worshiping Gideon right, right. instead of you see, and so uh, you know I don't think Gideon necessarily meant it like that at no, all. I don't think so at all. I he th- meant it to to worship. I God think he with. was trying to honor God, right? And people are people, right? And they did not. People want to lift up good Christians, right? Yeah, it's don't a natural they? thing. I mean, I say good Christians, and it becomes a thorn don't in their flesh. There's no brother. such thing as a good Christian. They're all bad. They want to lift up people <laughs> right. that that shine well that's right. for God. And because that's human nature. We lift these people up and we we put them up on a shelf and and then they we think they can do no wrong and it in in a way becomes somewhat of an idol. Idol worship. And we got to stop doing that. Sure. But it's human nature. That's what men, that's what people of God have always done. Right. They have always fallen into this trap. Right. And so that's what happens here. Gideon's trying to do something good for God, um, and it, it backfires on him. They end up uh, lifting him up more than than God. Right. And this also uh, apparently uh, ten years. Well, I don't know. It's further than that because. Uh, 
they have 40 years of peace again right <laughs> before they got to deal with it again but it looks like about the time Gideon dies uh, they return to Baal worship yep so uh, things go awry again uh, again it, uh, it's the same same over story different and day over and, over. and yep. uh, but the, but the cool thing is that that God took a man who was inept inadequate and ill prepared and empowered him prepared him strengthened him and equipped him right to serve yeah and allow him to be a vessel for God's mighty hand and wow. and that's what we are called to be that's right and so he has we have the ability to 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 allow God to work through us in the same manner and that's why we say you know this Gideon is a type and shadow of Christ Christ working in a flawed man to bring about his kingdom which is we are types and shadows of Christ right right yep God working in flawed us to bring about his kingdom which yeah. is so cool so. Yeah, if we can just keep from lifting each other up and uh, putting each other on a pedestal right <laughs> and ended up in that same trap that's again. the problem so all right Whew. and now the news All right. Well, uh, recently on social media, uh, people have been posting about Richard Dawkins again. I don't know if you know about Richard, Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins. Are you kidding me? I've read Richard Dawkins' <laughs> book. What do you think? The guy is insane. He is crazy. He, well, he's he's mad. The God delusion. That's that's the bottom line. Yeah. Have you read the God delusion? Well, God's an angry person. Yes, God. If, if, if the God of God the is Bible evil. is real, he's evil, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which it, this is really interesting, though. Uh, in a comment he made, I need to stamp that book. By the way, yeah, you know that stamp that you sent me through social, meme. social media. Yeah, it's it says heretical. Heretical garbage, garbage for uh, research purposes only. Right. <laughs> I've got a lot of books I need to stand for that. That's but, great. <laughs> go ahead. Okay, so back in 2010, Richard Dawkins made a statement uh, that he thinks Christianity might be the best defense against jihad. With all kinds of debate wow. about racial Islam, is, uh, Islam swirlingly lately, especially among pro, uh, presidential candidates, and even last night's State of the Union address, or the other night, uh, Dawkins' words have ex- uh, experienced a resurgence on Facebook and Twitter. So there's, I mean, people have been quoting him. This is a, uh, this is his quote. He says, "There's, n- there are no Christians, as far as I know, blowing up buildings. I am not aware of any Christian suicide bombers. I am not aware of any major Christian denomination that believes the penalty for apostasy is death. Well, I am uh, aware of some. Um, <laughs> sorry, he said. You gotta take what you can get. Yeah, he said. I have mixed feelings about the decline of Christianity, in so far as Christianity might be a bulwark against." something worse which is pretty prophetic a little bit Mm kind of interesting so the man who's totally an atheist uh, thinks yeah, that, that's an understatement. Yeah, the man who's an angry atheist, <laughs> hardcore against Christianity, says something nice about Christianity for a change. But anyways, have, have you ever seen the documentary Ex- Expelled with I have. Ben Stein? Yeah. Oh, that is so good. Anyway, it's got an interview that he does with right. Richard Dawkins, in it. and Richard Dawkins didn't know that Ben Stein was doing a pro-Christian wow documentary. Right. He thought it was gonna promote his views yeah and so man he got blindsided in that (laughs) wow he got blindsided big time and it is so condemning of richard's views yeah well i mean and he is the heralded atheist like oh yeah he's the number one he's the go-to guy he's the go-to guy and so yeah it's it's uh but it's interesting he says that about christianity versus muslim what do you think about that you think christianity is the bulwark against Mm. <laughs> well, I don't think Christianity, uh, by its nature, will overtake. I think Christ Himself, yes, of may, course, he will. Will you know, can win that battle? But I sure. think Christianity is not intended to uh, to win the world right. over those type of things. I, believe, um, I agree. I with think you. that that Christianity it flourishes best best when it is suffering. Sure. So, you know, in the Muslim convert or die, the Christian says, I'll, you know, I'll stand here and try to convert you until you kill me. Right, right. <laughs> which is, 
which is um, y- you know and even you know atheists and evolutionists uh, one of the arguments that even falls into their that they don't even really think about is altruism is the very is at the very heart of Christianity right, right. Um, however altruism is totally against uh, the the uh, was it natural selection? Right. Natural selection and and altruism do not go together. They can't it, fit. it can't fit together. So right. because the survival of the fittest, that's what natural that's right. selection is, and so it's a dog eat dog world. Right. And if, if true Christians will roll over, you know, before they'll sure. before they'll, um, you know. Blow the other side up. That's right. <laughs> you know, or whatever. That's the truth. All right. Uh, next in the news, producer says the silver chair will launch a brand new Narnia franchise. Woo! Yeah. Are you excited about that? I am. The Chronicles of Narnia is about to be rebooted. Mm-hmm. Six years after the conclusion of the Big Scream trilogy, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Prince Caspian, and The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, a movie version of C.S. Lewis's classic fantasy series is back in the works. Yay. And though technically the silver chair will be a sequel, it will also essentially be a reboot from the franchise. Collider spoke with uh, producer uh, Mark Gordon, who explained it's all going to be a brand new franchise. All original, all original characters, different directors.